Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. Turn with me to today's gospel, which is according to St. Luke, chapter 14, verse 25 to 33. And the gospel begins in verse 25, which says, Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. So let's stop there for a moment. So we see that a lot of people are on, the road, on this road trip with Jesus. And surely these great crowds of people are following Jesus all for their own different motives. Yet Jesus considers all of them aspiring disciples. And so he turns to them and he begins to test them in three areas to see if they have what it takes to follow him to actually be his disciples. And so disciple test number one is in verse 26. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Jesus actually said hate. Now, some of you might be feeling like, like saying, Jesus, don't you understand? Telling people to hate their mother and father is not how you're going to attract followers. Okay? When you get a big crowd, you're supposed to make them feel good. But Jesus was less interested in numbers and more interested in the quality of a disciple. So I remember one day before I entered the seminary, I convinced my dad to read the Bible with me. And he sort of reluctantly agreed, but he opened the Bible. He just opened the Bible and he began to read. And lo and behold, what verse do you think he turned to? Luke 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me without hating his father, my dad's eyes got big and he blew up and he slammed the Bible shut. He said, so what happened to honor your father and mother? You know, what happened to that? Does that mean that you hate me? And I remember, and, and I really didn't know how to interpret this verse, so, but my gut instinct was, no, Dad, I, I don't hate you. I love you. But I love Jesus more than you. That was my gut interest. I love Jesus more than you. And I remember we had sort of an argument there, and my dad my, and my mom saved the day. She, she came into the room and brought this Bible commentary, the Navarra Bible commentary from Spain, and she began to read the correct interpretation of this verse. And, and we learned that the word hate in Greek, and especially in Hebrew and the Aramaic languages that Jesus spoke, does not refer to emotions or feelings, but instead to attitudes and actions and decisions. So the word hate in Hebrew is basically an idiom that means to love less than or to prefer one person over another. In other words, if you are ever put in a situation where you have to make a decision between the Lord and the greatest human love in your life, the human love loses. That's what it means. If in a moment of decision, your dad says, don't become a priest, like he said to me, yet God says, I'm calling you to be a priest, then you have to say, sorry, dad, I'm going to do what God wants. If in a moment of decision, your mother says, go left, and God says, go right, then which way should you go? You go right. Otherwise, Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple. If one day your husband says, do this, and God says, do that, you have to say, I'm sorry, honey, I love you, but I'm going to do what God wants. If one day you have to choose between your wife or your husband and God, for as much as you love your spouse, they lose. You see, God is not second to your wife. He created your wife. God is not second to your husband. He created him. God is not second to your children. He created your children and loves them more than you do. This means that there is to be no authority in your life that supersedes the authority of Christ in your life. This means that you must love God so high above father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, boyfriend, and girlfriend, that in your actions or decisions, not your feelings, it might look like you hate them. 
And the Lord Jesus said that if you can't do that, then you cannot be my disciple because you won't have what it takes to follow me. Basically he's saying that. In other words, you have to be willing to say to all the people you love, yeah, I love you, but I love Jesus more than you. I love Christ above you. In other words, we have to reprioritize every human relationship in our life. Now, if you really do love our Lord more than any human being, then you have just passed disciple te discipleship test number one. We got two more to go though. But Jesus wanted to further test these would-be disciples in the area of self-love. So test number two is found in verse 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You see, in the time of Jesus, a person who was carrying their cross was most likely on a one-way journey to their own crucifixion and death. And Jesus really meant this because all of his disciples, except one, were killed for the faith. St. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. St. Andrew died on a cross also. St. Bartholomew was flayed alive. St. James, the son of Zebedee, he was beheaded. St. James, the son of Alphaeus, he was beaten to death. St. Thomas, he was run through with a lance. St. Matthias, he was stoned and then beheaded. St. Matthew was slain by a sword. St. Thaddeus, he was shot to death with arrows. St. Philip, he was hanged. Only St. John died of natural causes. You know what this means? <laughs> it means that being a disciple of Jesus is a lot more than just coming to church on Sunday. Being a disciple of Jesus means the willingness to follow Christ wherever he leads, even if that means leading to the cross, the suffering and death. Otherwise, Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple. Why? Because you won't have what it takes. You won't have what it takes. And then Jesus, to get this point across even more clearly, gave them several illustrations. Let's look at one of them. Verse 28. Which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Now, I imagine that only very few of us have actually worked in the construction of a tower. But I know that a lot of us have worked at the construction, not of a tower, but of a marriage, at the construction of a family or a friendship, the construction of a career, a business or a ministry. The point is that if you are trying to construct anything good in your life, then you must first sit down and do what? Jesus says, calculate the cost. For example, if you are a young couple and you are madly in love with each other, that's beautiful, that's wonderful. But before you say, I do, you better pull out your calculator and calculate the cost. The cost not just of the wedding and honeymoon, but the cost of living together with that person for the rest of your life. And if you find that you do, that you do, that you do have what it takes to make it to the end, in good times and in bad, in poverty and in wealth, in sickness and in health, then you say, check, I do, okay? Unfortunately, there are many persons that begin to construct something in their life with, with, with determination and with enthusiasm, but they find out that it costs more than they imagined. And halfway through, they begin to have second thoughts, and, and then they abandon the construction, you know, halfway. You know why many people abandon their marriage? Because before getting married, they didn't do what? sit down to calculate the, the cost. Even some priests have abandoned their marriage. So you know why? Because they didn't do what? Sit down and calculate the cost. So what is the cost? Well, it's the cross. And what, what is your cross? A married person once said to me, my cross? 
I'm married to him, you know, married. And Jesus said, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. But then Jesus provided a third and final test for these aspiring disciples that wanted to follow him. Verse 33, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Now, to renounce does not necessarily mean to give away, but it does mean to detach from, to literally say like goodbye to. Yet this test is, is probably really difficult because you cannot live in contemporary America and not be tempted by materialism. For example, I heard the story of a man who was driving his brand new BMW, nice BMW. And he was just driving a little too fast. He wanted to go out, you know, drive fast in, in the hill country. And he entered a curve a little too fast, went into the opposite lane. Unfortunately, at the exact same moment, a truck was coming in that lane. So the BMW just flew off the road and just flipped and flipped. And because the man was not wearing his seatbelt and he, he was thrown from the car and his arm was severed in the accident. Meanwhile, the man in the truck immediately stopped, you know, calls 111, runs to see if he could help the man. And when he got there, he heard the man just groaning, oh no, not my BMW, not my BMW, my BMW, not my BMW. And the truck driver was trying to stop the bleeding, you know, he severed his arm and he, and he would, but the man just kept saying, no, no, not my BMW, he's like crying, you know. And the truck driver finally says, sir, right now you have bigger problems than your BMW. Haven't you noticed you lost your arm? And the man looks over at his arm laying over there and he starts saying, oh no, not my Rolex, not my Rolex, you know? You see, some people right now are spiritually dying. Yet they're more concerned about their material possessions. Some marriages right now are hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging, and yet they are not concerned about their, they're more concerned with their material possessions because they're always fight about money. And Jesus said, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions, that means detach from them. You cannot be my disciple. So let's quickly review, okay, the test. So in the gospel, Jesus places three conditions without which they will not have what it takes to be like him. One, to repri reprioritizing their relationships. Two, the willingness to follow Christ even to the cross, even suffering and death. And three, detachment from all possessions. And these three conditions can be summarized in one phrase, to love a love for Jesus that is willing to sacrifice without counting the cost. Wow. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling sort of inadequate. You know, I imagine most of us are maybe feeling pretty inadequate disciples, like, whoa, I don't know if I could ever measure up to Jesus' expectations here. You consider this. Jesus said something amazing to his disciples at the Last Supper. In John 15, 16, he said, It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you. So do me a favor. Say to the person next to you, It was Jesus who chose you. Could you tell them that? Just say, It was Jesus who chose you. Just turn to the person next to you and say, It was Jesus who chose you. In other words, Jesus didn't call the best of the best to be his disciples. Our Lord chose uneducated fishermen. He chose common folk. He chose the B team. He chose the second string. <laughs> he chose us. Why? Precisely because he knew that we could never measure up to his standard. He wanted them and he wants us to understand our need for his love and our need for his grace given by the Holy Spirit. Question, why is our Lord calling you to be his disciple? It's simple, because he actually thinks you can do it. In fact, Jesus knows that with his love and his grace, you will have what it takes. 
to complete the task and to make it to the end. Lord Jesus, thank you for calling us to be your disciple despite our misery. Thank you for renouncing all your possessions for love of us. Thank you for carrying your cross for love of us. Take, Lord, receive all I have and possess. You have given all to me. Now I return it. Give me only your love and your grace. That's enough for me. Your love and your grace are enough for me. Amen.